Hey, if you have your Bible with you this morning, turn to Matthew chapter 27. While you're turning or clicking there, find someone to your left or your right, and maybe tell them that you are glad that they are here. Come on, tell them that you are glad that they are here. Tell, them, tell someone that they're looking good in the house of God this morning. And while you're doing that, I'm going to say welcome to those of you joining us online. Thank you for making time to worship Jesus. Come on, we're going to grow in our faith together today. As we continue in our series, These Walls Must Fall. And I'm talking about the idea that all throughout the Bible, the Bible has a lot to say about this concept of walls. There's over 255 mentions of the word wall. In our culture, there's some walls that need to be built and restored. Isaiah chapter 61 talks about how we as the people of God will be used to to restore and rebuild some of the things that have been decimated or destroyed or we've drifted from in our culture. There's some walls that need to be rebuilt Walls around marriages and families and gender and sexuality, there's walls that need to be built that are protective walls that God ordains to protect his people. But in other ways, there are walls that need to come down. There are walls that hinder and and prohibit people from really walking into the fullness of the blessing that God has for us as the people of God. And the Bible talks about the, the fact that we are of this world, but we don't war according to the ways that the world Uh, wars, and that we have weapons of our warfare that are powerful for bringing down what the Bible describes as strongholds, which that word stronghold uh, literally means a fortress of walls. And so that's what we've been talking about. But today, I felt like the Lord really caused me to see something differently that I'm excited about preaching to you today. The tagline for the series, These Walls Must Fall, is Breaking Barriers to Blessing. And the Lord just began to remind me of one of the greatest barriers that has ever existed to walking in the blessing of God and how Christ himself was used by God to bring down this barrier so that you and I can experience the fullness of a blessed relationship restored with our heavenly father. And so we're going to dive into Matthew chapter 27, which is the story of Jesus's crucifixion. And and we're going to, to mine out one of the Areas that is so clearly described in Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, his crucifixion, that is commonly overlooked, underappreciated, undertaught on, and so thus we really don't fully grasp, many of us as believers, the fullness of what God's trying to convey to us that Jesus did for us at the cross of Calvary. And so I, I want to encourage you to open your heart to, to, to hear and receive. You know, most times I, I, I tend to preach where others are more gifted to teach. Some messages are more inspirational. That's kind of the side that I tend to fall on, but other messages are more informational. And today, I think you'll see what I mean here in a few moments. This message, hopefully there's still some inspiration to be found for you, but there's also gonna be a lot of information. And sometimes I'm just encouraging you, and and other times I'm educating or equipping you with truths from God's word. And again, hopefully today, both will occur, but we're gonna dig into a lot of what God's word has to say about what I believe is one of the most significant and powerful things that, again, Jesus himself did for you at the cross, and it's right in the word of God. And yet I would wager to say many of us have never heard a message about this, and many of us maybe don't fully understand or comprehend the significance, the weight, the gravity of what occurred when this passage occurred at at the crucifixion of Jesus. So, you know, most people are familiar with the main themes, the most, the, 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 the monumental things that happened in the story of the crucifixion of Jesus, the big elements of the story. We remember the Last Supper and how Jesus gathered his disciples and shared and broke bread with them and instructed them about things to come. We remember that Jesus was betrayed by Judas. We remember the Garden of Gethsemane and that interaction with the Roman centurions. We remember Jesus' fervent prayer to God. We remember Jesus going and appearing before Pontius Pilate. We remember Uh, Pontius Pilate listening to his wife who was encouraging him to let Jesus go. And you remember what Pontius Pilate did? He He gave the people two options. And he said, I'll give you Jesus or I'll give you Barabbas. And I think he thought for sure that they would say, we want Jesus because Jesus was a good man, a prophet, had done miracles and signs and wonders amongst the people. But do you remember what they said? They said, give us Barabbas. And and just a side note, if you look into the name Barabbas, in the original language, when you look into it, the way that it translates into our modern day language, believe it or not, the name Barabbas literally translates in modern terms to the name Tom Brady. (laughs) 
believe it or not, I know it sounds hard to be, it's hard to be, to believe, right? But my wife just said, let it go. I'm convinced that God is going to cause Tom Brady to make it to heaven and have a mansion right next door to mine in heaven, you know. But I'm still going to be flying my chief's flag right out there in the front yard. Someone say amen. amen. Hey, it's, it's, a, it's a good day to be a football fan in the state of Kansas. Someone say amen as well, huh? Come on. All of our teams are winning. So we remember these, these prominent themes. Give us Barabbas, the crown of thorns, the lashes and stripes upon Jesus' back by which we are healed. The Via Dolorosa, the two thieves, one on either side of Jesus, one who mocked and scorned and ridiculed Jesus, the other who made a simple declaration of faith by saying, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And do you remember what Jesus said back to him? He said, truly, I tell you, this, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. I think that's powerfully awesome that God included that in the story of the crucifixion. You know what it speaks to me? It speaks to me about just high of a price that Jesus paid so that the, low, the bar could be low for you and I. It's not about our religious deeds. Did you, have you ever thought about that? That thief on the cross who the Bible describes made it into heaven, he never served in his church, he never gave an offering, he never got baptized, he never had communion. All he did is put his faith and trust in Jesus Christ in his dying moments. And Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. Truly, you will be today. I think that's an encouragement, by the way, for any of you who have maybe had a loved one who has passed on and you weren't sure if they had put their faith or hope in Jesus Christ. And I cannot guarantee you that they did, but I can encourage you that even if you did not see an abundance of evidence or any, even any evidence of them ever living their life for God, that even if just in a moment they had the, an awakening in their spirit, they had an a, 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 a opportunity to even just with their very last dying breath utter an acceptance of Christ, that I believe that that passage establishes that that person is waiting for you on the other side of eternity. Come on, isn't that good news to hold on to and to hope for? So we're we're familiar with these main elements, but there's a powerful, monumental occurrence that happens as part of the crucifixion of Jesus that is in black and white terms represented in the Gospels, but it's only given one little verse in the accounts given in the Gospels. And so oftentimes we overlook it. And I want to encourage you that, that as we dig into this a little bit more today, that the significance of this event is hard to overstate in our lives as believers, and that having a deeper understanding of the power and the significance of this sometimes overlooked and underappreciated part of the crucifixion story can significantly empower, encourage, and embolden us as believers, and for sure cause a greater level of appreciation for what Jesus did at the cross for you and for me. So come on, let's dig into God's word, Matthew chapter 27. Before we do, let's pray. I'll pray over us corporately, but would you pray right where you are, man of God? Would you pray right where you sit today or where you are, woman of God, uniquely over your circumstances, your situation, what you're going through, what what you're up against? And and I care so deeply for every one of you as brothers and sisters in Christ. And how many of you know God cares even more about every detail, every struggle, every challenge, every opportunity that lies before you? So come on, let's turn to him. Let's call upon him. Let's ask him to do what only he could do. Father, that's our prayer today in this place. We're so thankful already, Lord, for what you've already done. Thank you for the lives that that have been changed as evidence through the baptisms. Thank you for the opportunity. It's a privilege, Lord, to open your, your word and to visit your promises today. And God, we thank you that today you would do what only you could do, Lord, in the lives of people, anyone and everyone, Lord, who's maybe hurting or struggling, weak or weary or wounded in any area of their life, God, physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally, would you come and would you heal? Would you restore? Would you bring hope? Would you bring life? Would you bring strength, God? Would you bring freedom from bondages, Lord? Would you help us to grow and look more and more like Jesus today? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Come on, God, all God's people said, all right, Matthew chapter 27, Verse 45 is where we'll pick it up, and here's what it says, the account of Jesus' crucifixion. Now, from the sixth hour until the ninth hour, there was darkness over all the land. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, that is, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Some of those who stood there, when they heard that, said, this man is calling for Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and took a sponge and filled it with sour wine and put it on a reed and, and, and lifted it up, offering it to Jesus to drink. 
And the rest said, let him alone. Let us see if Elijah will come to save him. Isn't that true in your life that when you're going through a time of need, when you're going through a difficult or dark moment, there's, there's a group of people that will come to your aid and to your side to offer to be a blessing, and there's inevitably another group of people, the haters in life, that are standing, watching, waiting, some even hoping for your demise. And I don't know about you, but come on, let, let, let me be found in the camp of people that when someone's in a time of need, I run to their side and I see how I could be a blessing to them. Come on, don't you appreciate those kind of people in your life? And would you, would you commit along with me to be that type of person in someone's life? It's what Jesus was experiencing. A group of people that wanted to come and help him, a group of people that kind of were standing back saying, let's see if he really is who he says that he is. And Jesus, it says, cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. In other words, Jesus perished upon the cross in this very moment. Verse 51, here's the significance that we're driving towards today. It says, then, your translation might say, at that very time or at that very hour, behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And the earthquake, watch this, the veil was torn from top to bottom, and that's what I'm going to talk to you about today. What this signifies, what this was about, this veil that was torn from top to bottom. And reading on, it says, as the veil was being torn from top to bottom, as Jesus was breathing his last, it says, the earthquake, the rocks were split, graves were even open, many bodies of saints who had fallen asleep beforehand were raised and came out of their graves after the resurrection went into the holy city and appeared to many. Wow, what a scene. Can you imagine? And watch what it says right here, verse 54. So when the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus saw the earthquake and all the things that had happened, the darkness that descended upon the earth, the veil in the temple being miraculously, supernaturally ripped from top to bottom, all simultaneously occurring with the last breath of Jesus, really? It says, when they saw these things, they feared greatly, and they said, truly, this was the Son of God. If you've ever wondered how the gospel of Jesus Christ could begin to advance and what began as one person in a small group of disciples could begin to expand with many, many hundreds and thousands, and now they say over two billion people have placed their faith and their trust in Jesus Christ. Man, God got people's attention. Can you imagine the, 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 the stirring that would have been happened in the city? Can you imagine the atmosphere of all these things occurring simultaneously with the crucifixion of Jesus Christ? So at the very moment that Jesus died, the earth became dark. The ground began to shake. And it says the veil of the temple was torn into from top to bottom. And that's significantly important because this is telling us right from the start, this was God's idea, God's design. Not the thought or the idea or the invention of man. It happened from heaven towards earth. So what is this all about? This veil that was in the temple that was torn. Don't you think it's significant if it happened at the very moment that Jesus breathed his last upon that cross? It's powerfully significant. And to understand the significance of it, either a little bit more than you had before or perhaps for the first time, we have to look back to the Old Testament. And beginning in Exodus chapter 25... Exodus 26, and then followed up in Exodus chapter 40, God began to give Moses instructions for the construction of two very important items. One was the Ark of the Covenant, and the second one was the Tabernacle of Moses. Your Bible might call it the Tabernacle of Meeting. And the Ark of the Covenant was this very ornate box that God gave very detailed, painstakingly detailed instructions for how to construct this box, this ornate box made out of acacia wood, but was covered with gold and to be carried upon poles. In fact, I have an image that I wanted to share with you, just so if you haven't seen it before, based on the biblical description that you could go back and read for yourself. It's just too much to get into today in one message. But based on all the accounts, the size and the shape and the length and the width and the materials, that is what the Ark of the Covenant was believed to look like. And so Moses is given these instructions for the Ark of the Covenant and secondly for the tabernacle of meeting. And the tabernacle was to be a portable place of worship 
that would go with the people of God. Because if you remember, the people of God at this time in their history were a nomadic people. They had been rescued out of slavery from the house of Pharaoh and the land of Egypt, and God was traversing them towards the promised land of Canaan. And so God begins to give Moses these instructions for how to build this place that would house the Ark of the Covenant, which which was filled with the very presence of God, and that this tabernacle, this place of sacrifice, this place of worship, this place of beholding God's presence, how this would move with the people of God as they journeyed towards the promised land that God had established for them. And so we see that for the first time, the veil that was torn in the crucifixion scene of Jesus was established as part of the instructions that God gave Moses for this portable tabernacle, this portable place of worship. And Exodus chapter 26, verse 31, it's where we begin to see the specific detailed instructions that God gave Moses for this veil. And hang with me, I know it's a lot of information, but there's some revelation that, that's coming that will cause us to see even more what God did through Jesus Christ for you and I as believers and as people of God. So, so verse 31 of chapter 26 of Exodus says, inside this tabernacle, God was given instructions saying, make a special curtain, your translation might say a special veil, of finely woven linen, decorated with blue and purple and scarlet thread, colors of royalty, with skillfully embroidered cherubim, which were angels of heaven. And it says, going on, verse 33, hang this curtain from clasp and put the Ark of the Covenant in the room behind it. And this curtain will separate, this veil will separate the holy place from the most holy place. Then put the ark's cover, the place of atonement, also known as the mercy seat, your translation might say mercy seat, on top of the ark of the covenant inside the most holy place. And so here we find the instructions for, for, the, for the tabernacle, which include the instructions for the veil which was this massive curtain constructed to guard the most holy place, which was the place that the Ark of the Covenant was to be stored, which again represented the presence of God. And so in 2 Chronicles 3, well, I'll show you a picture here in a moment of the tabernacle, but in 2 Chronicles 3, 8 and 9, we find additional instructions for the construction of the holy place. And it says this, he made the most holy place 30 feet wide, corresponding to the width of the temple, 30 feet deep, He overlaid its interior with 23 tons of fine gold, and the gold nails that were used weighed 20 ounces each. They were about a pound and a half each, just the nails that were used to construct this. He also overlaid the walls of the upper rooms with gold. And so God's giving painstaking details about how to construct this tabernacle that would would at first be a portable place of worship that David would one day have a vision for establishing in a permanent way as the temple of God, which was eventually the temple that, the veil, that contained the veil that was torn during Jesus' crucifixion. But, but let me show you a picture, just so you can envision a little bit more. Here's a picture of the model of the, of the tabernacle. And you could see right there that there was a gate and there was an outer court where people could come. There was a, an altar right there of sacrifice. There was in the middle right there was what was called a laver, which was a place of washing, ceremonial washing, where the priests and the high priests would, 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 would cleanse themselves ritualistically but so that they could enter into the tabernacle. And inside the tabernacle there was the, the holy place, which was the first place you would enter into in the tabernacle. And then the, there you see the most holy place with the Ark of the Covenant residing in it there. And the veil was intended to protect the people from the, the, the holy of holies because the holy of holies re- represented, it contained the very presence of God. And so we find that, that, uh, that the book of Hebrews shows us that, that there's a pattern of worship that was, that was to take place only within the Holy of Holies. So, so that, that's the tabernacle. And hang with me, hang, stay with me, I know it's a lot of information. That's the tabernacle that was transportable, that moved with the people of God. And then David had a vision to build the permanent temple of God. But, but uh, in 2 Samuel 7, verse two, we see it says, the king summoned Nathan the prophet, and David said, look, I am living in a beautiful cedar palace, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. 
So he began to have this vision to build a dedicated place in the city of Jerusalem where, where the, that, that pattern right there, the outer court and the holy place and the holy of holies and the Ark of the Covenant would be housed in a permanent way. And David had the vision, but the Bible says it was Solomon who was actually approved and authorized to construct the temple. It was built at first by Solomon in 968 BC, about a thousand years before Christ. It was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians in 586 BC. And about 60 years later, in 515, it was reconstructed by Zerubbabel with the oversight of Ezra, the high priest. And so then that temple was ultimately destroyed again by the Romans in 70 AD as perfectly prophesied and predicted by by Jesus. So, So there's a little background about the tabernacle which housed the veil that was, would hang in ultimately the temple that Solomon and, 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 and uh, Sol- Solomon would, would build. It would be destroyed. It would be rebuilt by Zerubbabel. So the veil is hanging in the temple, protecting the people from the, from the, holy, pla- the, the holy of Holies, the most holy place. And when Jesus was crucified, it was torn. And the book of Hebrews is the New Testament account of the significance of the temple and the veil and the way that the cross had completely and radically forever changed the way that people would now worship and approach God. And so the book of Hebrews is a deep book. It's written to Jewish believers to help them to understand how this old system, this first and old covenant of, of, of the system of sacrifices uh, to, to be uh, right with God was now shifting and changing and had been fully accomplished by the blood of Jesus Christ. And so let's read together Hebrews chapter 9, which is, again, a New Testament account of how, how and why this was so significant. And here's what it says. Hang with me. Verse 1. The first covenant between God and Israel had regulations for worship and a place of worship here on earth. There were two rooms in that tabernacle. In the first room were a lampstand, a table, and sacred loaves of bread on the table. And this room was called the holy place. Then there was a curtain. Your translation might say a veil. Behind the veil or the curtain was the second room called the most holy place. In that room were a gold incense altar and a wooden chest called the Ark of the Covenant, which was covered with gold on all sides. And inside the ark was a a gold jar containing manna, which you remember which was the food that God sent from heaven to provide for his people. Um, Aaron's staff or his rod that had budded and sprouted leaves and the stone tablets of the covenant. And above it were the cherubim of glory overshadowing the mercy seat. Do, do we ha- still have that picture? Can you put that picture up again of the Ark of the Covenant? I just want you to be able to look at it while I, I, I just comment on this. So it says, in the room behind the veil was to be housed the Ark. Within the Ark were three things. The pot of manna that represent the, pr- the p- supernatural, miraculous provision of God. The, t- the stone tablets, which were literally the Ten Commandments, which represent the law of God, the commands of God. And then there was this this rod that had supernaturally budded that represents the direction and the correction of God. But those were inside the Ark of the Covenant. And the Bible's real clear right here. It says on top of of the Ark, you're to place a cover that's to be known as the mercy seat as the place of atonement. Here's why it's significantly important. That right from the very start, even in Old Testament times, God was saying, before you can encounter, before you can experience, before you can get to my law, which is my commands, before you can get to my staff, which represents my direction and my correction, before you can get to the manna, that provision of God, he said, you're gonna enter in through all of those things through the mercy of God, through the mercy seat, through this place of atonement. That all all my commands and my laws, my direction, my correction was always intended to be experienced through the mercy of God. Come on, aren't you grateful for the mercy of God? And and, and, and reading on, it it begins to describe the significance of the most holy place. And hang with me, we're almost done kind of laying the background of this so we can dig into why it's important to you and to me. So it says this in in verse 6 of Hebrews 9, it says, when all these things were in place, The priest regularly entered the first room as they performed their religious duties, but only the high priest ever entered the most holy place, and only once per year. 
There was a, a day called Yom Kippur, which was the day of atonement, and that's the day that it's speaking of. And on that day, only the high priest would wash himself twice. He would change out of his normal priestly garments and put on a, a garment that was only white, and he would enter in. But it says he always offered blood for his own sins and for the sins that the people had committed in ignorance. Verse 7. By these regulations, the Holy Spirit revealed that the entrance to the most holy place, catch this, was not freely open, as long as the tabernacle and the system it represented were still in use. Reading on verse 9 and 10, almost done. This is the illustration pointing to the present time. For the gifts and sacrifices that the priests offer are not able to cleanse the consciences of the people who bring them. For the old system deals only with food and drink and various cleansing ceremonies, physical regulations that were only in effect until a better system could be established. And Jesus is the one who came to establish the better system for you and for me. And reading on verse 10, it says, the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of good things, someone say good things, that were yet to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. So the, the tearing of the veil represents this fundamental shift, this powerful change from this old system into a new, and the Bible is very clear, a better system. Why was it better? Because it no longer involved imperfect people continually and consistently and frequently having to bring sacrifices to be made right in the sight of God. In the new and the better system, in the new and the better covenant that God speaks of through his word, that is accomplished only and solely through the shift blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, aren't you grateful that now we get to enter in to a relationship with God through only what Jesus could do, that it's no longer on us to bring sacrifices to church and it's no longer on us to shed, shed blood of things to be made right with God. Come on, that was not the best way and, and that's what Jesus is about is the transference into a new and better way. And Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that because of Jesus, there would no longer be a separation. That this veil that hung keeping people except for the high priest and even the high priest could only go in once a year on the day of atonement. And it tells us there will no longer be a separation between God and man. That through Jesus, we can now approach God and not just approach him, but do it with confidence, to do it with boldness. That's exactly what we're about to read in verse 19. Hebrews 10, it says, therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place, why? By the blood of Jesus by a new and living way, open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. It says no longer will there be a physical veil that keeps people from experiencing and encountering and approaching God, he says, now you'll approach God through Jesus Christ. And God will no longer, a holy God will no longer see you as a sinful people because it says right there, the body of Christ is now the veil between God and man. And when God sees you, when you approach God, he no longer sees you for your sins, your shame, your imperfections, your misdeeds, your missteps. He now sees you, yes, you, in spite of all those things that you might have really done, really said, he now sees you through the blood of Jesus Christ and he says welcome if he was a Texan he'd say y'all come into my presence approach me and it says right there with confidence with boldness so here's what I want to encourage you with the tearing of the veil when Jesus breathed his last upon the cross of Calvary was powerfully significant it, it, it was earth shattering literally the earth shook it was this amazing transference, this monumental occasion where God was saying, no longer will you be required to offer these sacrifices. Jesus, we sang it earlier, paid it all. And no longer will you have to come to me through the, the sacrifices of others and through the, through, through the rituals of others and through all these things, you can approach me through Jesus Christ. And here's what I wanna encourage you with. These are five ways that because the veil was torn, because Jesus paid the price, because Jesus made the way, and because God now sees you and I through Jesus Christ, these are five ways we can now approach God. Number one is directly. It says, brothers and sisters, it's speaking to you. It's speaking to me. And you got to understand how significant this was. The writer of Hebrews was writing to people who for generations 
had understood that the only way that they could be appro- that they could approach God was through the representation of the priests and the high priest. And I'm telling you today that Jesus changed it all for the better. It says, brothers and sisters, you and I, and it says we have the confidence to enter where the most holy place. We, we, you and I, no requirement for a priest or a preacher or a Sunday school teacher. Nothing wrong with those people. They serve important, valuable roles in our life. They, they help instruct us and equip us and teach us and care for us. But as it regards your ability to relate to God, to talk to God, to pray to God, to be forgiven by God, you no longer need a priest or, again, a preacher or a Sunday school teacher. That is now open and available freely as an invitation to you, every man, every woman, every young person who will put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on, who's grateful that now you could go directly to the heart of God through Jesus Christ? We can come directly. Number two, we can come completely. Hebrews 10, 11 says this, that the previous system of sacrifice under the old covenant, in that, in that old covenant, the priest stands and ministers before the altar day after day, offering the same sacrifices again and again, which can never take away sins. But in verse 12, watch this, it says, but our high priest, speaking of Jesus, offered himself to God as a single sacrifice for sins, good for all time. It will never expire, and there's never a sin that you will ever think or do or commit that is not covered by the perfect sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for you that now makes you right and acceptable in the eyes of God. He said, in the old system, we constantly had to be doing these things season to season and day to day and year to year. And he says, now through one man, Jesus Christ, there's been one gift, one price that was paid that forever and ever will cause you to be forgiven in the sight of God. Come on, we could come directly to God and we can be completely covered through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Come on, who's grateful that every sin you've ever done or will ever do is completely covered by the blood of Jesus? Number three, we could come boldly. We could come boldly. And I love the way the New Living Translation says the version of the scripture that we just read a little bit ago, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 19, once again says, and so dear brothers and sisters, come on, he's, he's pleading for you and I to understand that this is, this is for you and I. And he says, we can boldly enter, boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. Reading on, his, by his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place, which is where God's presence resides. And since we have a great priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. My dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Hebrews 4 reiterates it for us using this same language when it says this, so then, since we have such a great high priest, speaking of Jesus, who has entered heaven, Let us hold firmly to what we believe. This high priest of ours understands our weaknesses. He faced all the things and the testings that we did, yet he did not sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly. Someone say boldly. To the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. He says, you can come boldly now. You don't need to come sheepishly. You don't need to come beggingly. He said, you could come boldly into my throne. He says, you're no longer slaves, but now you're sons and daughters, and I'm a good father, and you can approach me with the confidence that I care for you in every season of your life. And how many of you have kids, and you know that it would feel a little awkward if your kids came to you, and they were always apologetic, and they were always kind of covered with shame for the way that they were an inconvenience to you, and how many know sometimes they are? (laughs) But eventually you'd say, hey, would you quit apologizing for the inconvenience that you are to me? Would you quit apologizing for the burden that you are on our fight? It's, it's my pleasure. It's my joy. It's my honor. It's my privilege to work to provide for my family. It's my privilege. It's my pleasure. It's my honor to be present in your life. And if you didn't have an earthly father that's living that way towards you, I'm telling you, you have a heavenly father that desires to be an ever-present help in every season, every time, every chapter of the life that you are living, every chapter of the story that God is writing in your life. He says, would you come boldly to me? Would you come boldly to me? And how many times do we not take this to heart? Or we think it maybe is true for someone else that maybe hasn't made as many mistakes as I've made And we still kind of approach God kind of tentatively. 
or tepidly or sheepishly because we feel like, man, it might be good for someone else, but can God really, truly, fully love and accept me? If what Pastor T says is true, he knows everything that I've been through and gone through and I'm still going through. And the answer is yes. And that's the significance of the veil being torn from top to bottom. Was God saying this moment that I ordained from the foundation of time where I'm sending my son to give his life, to pay the price, to be the sacrifice, to make a way that you can't make in your own strength, to, to make a way that there's no longer this separation that sin creates inevitably in the lives of imperfect people dealing with the holy God. He said, I'm sending Jesus to make a way that you could be restored out of a system of religion into a place of relationship. And when you begin to get this, when you begin to see this, it changes the way that you see God and it changes the way you approach God and it changes the way that you see yourself. You're no longer just a slave or a servant of God. You're a daughter of the Most High. You're a son of God. And he says, you can come boldly before my presence. Number four, we can come continually. We can come continually. And in the previous system that was the imperfect system, there were, there were holy days, there were seasons, there were moments of sacrifice and that again had to be done and repeated to continually ensure that the people of God were being made right with God. And, and he, he says now you could do it day by day, moment by moment, hour by hour. I'm constantly accessible to you. My presence is available to you because of Jesus, because I now see you through Jesus, that you could come to me continually, that you don't have to go through a person you could come directly and you don't have to wait for Sunday or Wednesday to get right with God or to get close with God or to cry out to God. He says in every moment, every season of your life, he says you could call out to me and I'm ever present help in your time of need. We could come continually. I'm telling you today that, that we, when we need God the most, we deserve him the least. And he says right now, you don't need a person and you don't need a church service and you don't need a platform and you don't need worship leaders and or pastors in skinny jeans. I could just <laughs> comment on myself if I'm gonna comment on someone else. You don't need lights or haze machines. You don't need any of those religious trappings. He said in any moment of your life, you could call upon me and I'll be there for you. We can come to him directly. We can come to him completely. We can come to him boldly. We can come to him continually. And lastly, as the worship team comes and begins to, to lead us and prepare to, to lead us into time and ministry, number five, we can come unconditionally. Unconditionally. And this is one of the greatest schemes that even the people of God who love God and love Jesus and have been forgiven deal with because if Satan can't keep you out of heaven, if he can't keep you from experiencing salvation, he comes and he tries to put religious trappings on you to keep you from enjoying the freedom and the fullness of the relationship that God acquired for you through Jesus Christ. And it says we could come unconditionally before God. Did you catch what it says when it said we could come boldly to the throne of grace? It said we come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace when in our time of need. You mean, not just on my good days? Not just on the days where I've kept my cool and been patient with my family and done the things I was supposed to do? Not just on those days, Pastor T? You mean I can come to God? You mean I can approach God? You mean God hears and knows and cares? Even on my bad days, that's exactly what it's saying. It says you can come boldly even in your time of need. I love what the New Living Translation says and how it unpacks that same verse. In verse 16 where it says, there we will receive his mercy. We will find grace to help us when we need it most. It bears repeating, when we need God the most, we deserve him the least. He knew that was the way it was gonna be. So through Jesus Christ, that's the way he set it up to be. Your worst day, your darkest moment, your doubtful moments, your fearful moments, your sinful moments, he says, you don't have to run from me and you don't have to go to a priest or a person and you don't have to wait for Sunday or Wednesday. He says, you could boldly come into my presence right there in your time of need, in the time where you need it the most. 
And because I see you now, not through your sins and imperfections, but now I see you through the veil of Jesus Christ and his body and his shed blood, he said, you could come to me even on your worst days. I don't know about you, but who's grateful for a deeper or new revelation that God is always accessible and available and approachable to you even on your worst day? And I don't know about you, but who's done with allowing the enemy to bring his schemes of guilt and shame and condemnation on you that causes you to think that you are unworthy or unlovable or unacceptable to God, maybe because of some real things you actually did, said, thought, or or, or about to do. The blood of Jesus changed it all. The veil of separation was torn. In the very moment that Jesus breathed his last, because it was God's statement. Again, it was torn from heaven down, not man's idea or design. It was God's idea and design. And he said, through Jesus Christ, you are separated no more from me by your sin. Accessible, available, approachable, directly, completely, boldly, continually, unconditionally. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. That's the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you stand to your feet? And as you're standing to your feet, would you just ask the Lord, just say, Lord, what are you speaking to me? Thanks for hanging with me. I know that was a lot of the Bible. That's a good thing to do in church, so kind of have an old school Bible study and dig into God's word. But I know it's a lot of deep language, but can you see the power and the significance of that event maybe a little bit more, a little bit more clearly than you did before? that this separation that existed is now, is now dealt with fully and completely through the cross of Jesus Christ. And I, I just feel led to pray over people who maybe still struggle with or deal with or under an attack of guilt or shame or condemnation that causes you to feel like you're unworthy, unlovable, unacceptable to God. That's a lie from the enemy. There's such a thing as conviction that, that, God, that comes from God that causes us to wanna kinda break free of some things that aren't God's best or are holding us back or hindering us from our relationship with God. But the Bible says there is zero, nada, none, no condemnation for those who are found in Christ Jesus, none. And so if that's you, maybe just you wanna just lift your hands before the Lord and I wanna pray over you boldly. Lord, I pray that you would break the scheme of guilt, shame, and condemnation that is from the enemy because your, your word is clear. There's no condemnation for those who are found in Christ. And each of us has sinned. Each of us has gone our, our, tried to go our own way. None of us is without sin. You might have really done the thing, said the thing, been in that place. I'm telling you today. The blood of Jesus is more powerful than any sin you've ever committed. Once for all, we just read. Don't allow the enemy to keep you in a place of guilt, shame, or condemnation. He can't keep you from heaven, but through those schemes, he can keep you from walking in the fullness of the freedom and joy that Jesus accomplished for you at the cross of Jesus Christ when he destroyed that barrier between God and man. And Lord, we just thank you that right now, right now, right now, whatever it is that has caused us to pick that up, we lay it down right now. And I pray in the place where there's been condemnation and guilt and shame, I pray that there would be a revelation of who we are to you, that we are chosen, we are loved, we are dearly beloved. Lord, you came to make a way to call us home into a place that transcends religion, but it's relationship. We're sons and daughters of a family and not just a family, it's a royal family with many benefits, with an inheritance, with a blessing that comes along with that. And Lord, I pray that we would begin to see it that way. I pray that that would begin to overwhelm the lies and the voice of the enemy. And I pray that today, Lord, there would just be a fresh season of relating to you the way that you desire for us to relate to you confidently, boldly, not because we could ever do anything to earn it or deserve it, but because because the blood of Jesus Christ has accomplished it forever for every person, every man, woman, and young person who will put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Come on, if you'll just receive that new level of freedom and grace and mercy in God today, come on, let's put our hands together for the, that work of God. And now lastly, we're about to worship one more time together, hopefully with maybe some renewed gratitude in our heart for what Jesus did for us what he destroyed, what he broke down, what he made possible for us.
But before we do that, I'm gonna give people the opportunity to experience that maybe for the first time or in a fresh way. And maybe you once knew God, loved God, grew up in the church, but you just drifted from him, gotten busy with life, gotten preoccupied with the cares of this world, and you've just drifted from serving God. You know God, you love God, but you, you're, you've drifted from serving him with your heart and with your life. And if that's you today, you're what the Bible describes when Jesus told that parable about the prodigal son. Someone who came and said, I want my inheritance, I'm gonna go and I'm gonna do it my own way and my own strength. And when the, that son came to the father and made that request, I think the father knew how it was gonna go for him. But there would be a day coming where he would end up kind of at the end of his rope, out of funds, out of friends. And that's, how, that's what the world will do to you. And eventually that son had this revelation. He said, what am I doing? I got a father who would provide for me and care for me. And he said, I'll go back and maybe he'll love me enough to just welcome me back as a servant in his house. It would be better to be a servant in the house of my father than to be out here living this way in the world. But you know what was powerfully true about that parable is that the father was welcoming, waiting, anticipating that day where that son would come back onto his property and come home and he wasn't gonna, it wasn't gonna be good enough for him to just welcome him home as a servant. He welcomed him home as a son. He met him at the edge of the property and he put a ring on his finger, the parable says, and a robe, a royal robe upon his neck. And he called a party, he called friends and family and said, let's celebrate because my son has come back home. And if that's you today, you've drifted from God tried to go and do it in your own strength, your own way, that's the heart of the Father for you today. He's like this. He's saying, through Jesus Christ, my arms are open and welcoming. And maybe there's some things we'll deal with. Maybe there's some things I'll help you get kind of cleaned up in your life, but we'll worry about that later through the context of a relationship restored. I'm just welcoming you back home. So if that's you, or maybe you've never received Jesus, never put your faith in Jesus, never received the forgiveness, of Jesus, the weight of sin and guilt and shame removed off of you, the way that only Jesus could do. Come on, you can't get good enough to get right with God. You can't earn it, you can't deserve it. It's a free gift, the Bible says, that we receive His grace by faith. And so if that's you, you've drifted from God and you need to come back home. Or today, for the first time, you need to be forgiven. Right now, this is your moment. Right now, this is your moment. And we're not gonna call you out or put you on the spot. Here's what I wanna ask you to do, just this one simple outward gesture. Would you just lift your hand towards your heavenly Father? Would you just lift your hand and just say, that's me. I need to come home. That's me, I, I, I need to be forgiven, to be washed, to be cleansed, to be made new. And even those of you joining us online, I think it would be powerfully important for you to make a moment, take a moment to lift your hand. Even if you're all by yourself, you're not responding to people or responding to a preacher, you're responding to your heavenly Father. And if you, if you raised your hand both in this room and online, you can lower it. Here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do with many people who said yes to Jesus, came home to their Father today. We're gonna pray this prayer with you. We're gonna pray it with you. And we do it for a couple reasons. One is we just wanna quickly come alongside you and show you right from the start there's a, there's a church family there are brothers and sisters in Christ that, that want to stand with you, that want to walk with you, that want to pray with you, that want to encourage you, that want to help you. If you stumble and it's inevitable that you will, at some point we want to help you get up and keep moving forward towards the purpose of God for your life in Christ Jesus. And the second reason we do it every week is because even as God is growing us and maturing us in our faith, and He is, it just helps us stay anchored to the reality that even as we are growing in our faith, we never graduate from grace. We still need the grace of Jesus. Everything God could ever build in our life, it's all being built on the foundation of unmerited grace and favor from Jesus Christ. So come on, let's pray this prayer together. Come on, pray with maybe some fresh boldness and enthusiasm today, along with many precious people who came home to Christ today. Come on, say, Father, in Jesus' name, I recognize my need for a Savior. And I thank you for sending Jesus to pay the price I could never pay to make a way that I might have a new life and a fresh start, and I give you my life, and I give you my trust. And because of Jesus, because of the cross of Jesus, so come on, say this loudly, I will never be the same, and then rejoice with all of heaven, come on. 
for the precious people who came home to Christ today. Man, aren't you grateful? Aren't you thankful for what Jesus made possible? That he destroyed the separation that existed between you and I and between our Father. We have perfect relationship restored with him. Come on, from just a fresh place of gratitude, let's praise God one more time together today. Then Amity will come and dismiss you.